In this video, we're going to look at the quality factor in passive filters. Let's first look at a simple LRC series circuit. We've analyzed this circuit in a previous video, and in that video, we determined that this was a two-pole filter, and we merely defined two parameters, omega naught and Q, and I called Q the quality factor. In this video, I'm going to describe why this is the quality factor and what physical significance it has in terms of the filter's performance. In this LRC circuit, we can measure the output in three different positions. We can measure the output across the capacitor, the inductor, or the resistor. And depending upon where we measure that output, we would get three different transfer functions. Notice that in all of these transfer functions, the denominator is the same. If we make the substitutions for the omega naught and Q that we just defined, then we can rewrite the transfer functions in terms of two constants, omega naught and Q, rather than the three constants we started with, L, R, and C. We wind up with three different transfer functions, and as we showed in the previous video, these three transfer functions correspond to three different filter types. Here's what the transfer function looks like for the low-pass case, that is, if we measure the output across the capacitor. Notice that the presence of the Q corresponds to a peaking right at the corner frequency of the filter. As Q gets higher and higher, we're moving left to right in these plots. Likewise, with the high pass filter, the higher the Q, the more of a peak we get right at the corner frequency of the filter. The same thing is also true with the band pass filter. The higher the Q, the taller the mountain that sits right at the center of the pass band. Going back to the circuit, we can see that all three of these filters were formed from the same circuit topology. It's just a series LRC filter. But what if I had chosen a different circuit topology in order to implement the filter? What if I had arranged the L, R, and C in some other way? Would the Q and omega naught have come out the same? Well, we know, for example, with a bandpass filter that we're going to have one zero and two poles, but is it always going to be the same zero and the same poles if we rearrange the circuit elements? That's what I plan to address here on the next slide. Let's look at a shunt-fed bandpass filter. We have our input voltage here on the left, and then we're going to be measuring the output across the load resistor. I'll label it VL, where L stands for the load, but actually it's also the voltage across the inductor with this particular circuit. Now this circuit is definitely different from the circuit we just looked at before because not all of the elements are in series. Here we have also two resistors rather than just one resistor. I've separated out the source resistance from the load resistance. Now we're going to find Q, and I'm going to talk about how to find it in the general case if you have two poles in the denominator. We're going to put the transfer function into a pole zero form with no coefficients in front of the S squared term in the denominator. If we look back at the previous circuit, we can see that that was exactly the form of the denominator for our series filter as well. What we're going to do in our new filter is to try to find a denominator that starts with S squared. Then we're going to identify omega naught. And then based on the term we find in this position in front of the S, we're going to identify Q. Then we're going to see if Q came out the same as it did in this example. First of all, we can go ahead and write the transfer function. We can use voltage division. We have three elements here in parallel. A capacitor in parallel with an inductor, in parallel with the resistor. That's what we have up here in the numerator. And then in the denominator, we just have the same three elements in series with the source resistance up here. If we simplify that all down and isolate the S squared term in the denominator, this is what we end up with. Now we can compare that to the form of the denominator that we had for the previous filter. We can see though that it's clearly a bandpass filter because we have a single S in the numerator, that is one zero, and we have an S squared term in the denominator, that is two poles. That's what we expect for a bandpass filter. If we write the denominator of the transfer function in the same form as we had for the series LRC filter, then we expect an S squared term plus something times S plus omega naught squared. We can thus identify one over LC as being our omega naught squared, and we can identify the term here in the box as omega naught over Q. Omega naught over Q then is just one divided by C times these two resistors in parallel. Knowing what omega naught is, we can then find Q. Q for this filter winds up being RS in parallel with RL divided by L omega naught. Looking back at our LRC filter, we can see that our Q had a different definition in that case. 
When I analyzed the simple LRC filter, I just defined Q and then it worked out to some position in the transfer function. Here, I'm looking at the transfer function and finding out what Q would have been in order for it to be in the same place in the transfer function. We can clearly see that these two circuits, despite both being bandpass filters, have a different definition of Q. That comes about, of course, because the circuit elements are arranged differently. What this means is that in general, you can't predict what Q is just by looking at the circuit. Q might be different for different circuits, even though physically it means the same thing for the circuit. In this particular circuit, the resistance R is in the numerator for Q. And this brings us to some terminology that I'd like to introduce you to. Loaded Q and unloaded Q. Loaded Q refers to the situation when you're loading down the circuit, that is, you're drawing power from the circuit. So for this particular circuit, that might be the case where the load resistor is small. A small load resistor draws more current from the power source, so it loads down the circuit, and then it's going to affect Q. Q is going to be smaller. Let's see how that looks like by plotting it out. If we have a loaded Q, it's going to use up more power from the circuit, have a smaller load resistance, and we're going to wind up with a wider peak here at the center of the passband. For a larger load resistance, on the other hand, we're going to call it an unloaded Q or an unloaded circuit, and the Q is going to result in a tighter peak right there at the center of the passband. So just some terminology for you to be aware of. Let's now look at this relationship between Q and the frequency response of the filter. I've shown how Q can be found by deriving the transfer function and then just looking at the denominator. But you can also get a feel for Q by just looking at the transfer function of the filter itself. Let's take a look at a Bode magnitude plot of a hypothetical bandpass filter. If it's a Bode plot, then we have decibels plotted over here on the left, and this is just the magnitude of our filter's response. On the horizontal axis, we have here plotted frequency, and that's also on a log scale. If it's a bandpass filter, then it should rise up here to zero decibels, that is one, and then fall back down. If it's a two-pole filter, then it's going to rise by 20 decibels per decade and then fall by 20 decibels per decade. So in theory, the slope of these lines out here will tell you how many poles the filter has. In this case, it's a two-pole filter. So we expect a 20 decibel per decade rise and then a 20 decibel per decade fall. Now Q is defined not only by its position in the denominator of a transfer function, but also by this simple relationship between the center frequency of the filter and the size of the passband. So note that Q equals F naught, that is the center of this passband here, divided by the width of the passband. Now the width has to be measured three decibels down from the peak. Well, why three decibels? Why not four or five or six decibels? Well, that comes about from the relationship of the point of half power. This is actually the full width at half max. If you're at the point of half power, given the relationship that power has to the square of the voltage, then you're going to be at the point where the voltage at the output is one divided by the square root of two times the voltage at the input. It just happens to work out to a number that's close to minus three. Because this width is in the denominator, it means that a wider looking curve is actually going to have a lower Q. And a tighter or narrower shape of the filter is going to have a higher Q or a higher quality factor. Now, if you plot the transfer function on a linear scale rather than a log scale, then you don't read down three decibels because there's no decibels on the y-axis. Without a log scale, if you want to find the full width at half max when it comes to the power, then you need to read down by one over square root of two times the voltage. So if you read down by one over square root of two and then you look at the two frequencies and find the difference between them, then that will give you the information you need in order to find Q. Therefore, we have two different ways to find Q. One is to look at the circuit, find the transfer function, and then look at the denominator of the transfer function. Q will be in a particular position in the denominator. Another way to find Q is to make a plot of the transfer function, measure the center of the passband, read down to the half power point, and find the full width at half max. Then you can use an alternative equation to find Q. 
That second relationship comes from the physical interpretation of Q. That is, Q is the total energy stored in a system divided by the energy lost in a cycle. It's these relationships that I'm going to now prove to you, because right now I've shown two different ways of finding Q, but I've not really shown how they're connected or why they're connected. The second method, by the way, of finding Q, that is looking at a graph and just reading it, is a method that's very useful because it doesn't require any prior knowledge of the circuit. You could have a black box circuit, and you have no idea how the circuit behaves, but you can learn a lot about it by looking at its frequency response. If you see the filter's response, say, on an oscilloscope, then you can find a lot about that filter. You can calculate its Q without knowing how the inductors, capacitors, and resistors are arranged. Let's take a look at a general transfer function representing a bandpass filter. Keep in mind that there are a number of different arrangements of circuit elements that could give exactly this transfer function. Notice that Q appears in its position in the denominator. For this analysis, I'm going to be using J omega instead of S. Next, I'm going to convert this transfer function into rectangular form by simply multiplying the numerator and the denominator by the complex conjugate of the denominator. So you see here in the denominator, I have a plus omega naught over Q times J omega. So I'm going to multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the denominator with this sign change down here. That will get rid of the imaginary number in the denominator. You see, after I've multiplied these two terms times one another here in the denominator, we just have a real number. Up here in the numerator, we have an imaginary number and a real number. Now I'm going to find the magnitude, because in these Bode plots, we're interested not so much in how the phase changes, but by how the magnitude of the voltage changes, or the magnitude of the transfer function changes. I've just used the Pythagorean theorem here. We've gone a certain distance here in the numerator along the real axis, and we've gone a certain distance up the imaginary axis. So those make the two sides of a right triangle, and then in order to find the length of the hypotenuse, we can just square them and take the square root. The denominator is just a real number, so the magnitude of a real number is a real number. So what we have now is just the magnitude of the transfer function. If it's a bandpass filter, the maximum of the transfer function is going to occur right in the center, and that frequency is going to be omega naught. If I plug in omega equals omega naught to this transfer function, then I can see a lot of these terms will disappear. If these terms disappear, then the transfer function's magnitude takes a very simple form, h naught q divided by omega naught. I would now like to read down by 1 over square root of 2 of the maximum, and find out what these two frequencies are. That can be done by equating this term with this large expression here. After setting these two expressions equal to one another, you might notice that we have only one variable, omega, and two constants, omega naught and q. So my goal here is to just solve this expression for omega. It turns out that omega will have four different solutions. Two of the solutions are negative, and negative frequencies are pretty much unphysical here. But then we have two positive solutions, and those are the two frequencies that I'm interested in. Here's what they are. Omega equals omega naught over 2q times something plus or minus something else. So these two expressions for omega give us our two points here on the graph. I could call one omega a and one omega b. Omega a would be the smaller one and omega b would be the larger one. Let's find the distance between these two frequencies. We could just take omega b minus omega a. That's just delta omega, and it works out to be omega naught over q. We can now then change positions of q and omega naught. We now have this spacing, delta omega, in terms of omega naught and q. I can then swap the positions of q and delta omega in order to find an expression for q. Therefore, we can conclude that Q is just the center frequency divided by the bandwidth. Now, that relationship came about because of the way Q was defined. And here, I didn't define Q based on the position of inductors, capacitors, or resistors in any actual circuit. I defined Q based on a position in the denominator of a particular transfer function. Let's go back then and review what we've done. If we start with a circuit, any LRC circuit, and it doesn't matter how the elements are actually arranged, and we derive a transfer function that looks similar to the one that we started with here, 
in our derivation, then we can identify Q. And with that definition of Q, we can look at a filter's frequency response and say that if the filter has a higher Q or a lower Q, then it's going to have a particular shape in its frequency response. What we can say in particular is that a filter with a high Q will have kind of a peak in its frequency response, and a filter with a lower Q will have a more gentle slope or gentle peak in its frequency response. We've derived these relations explicitly for a two-pole filter, but Q also has meaning for more complicated filters. Even in a complicated filter, you don't necessarily have to go through a very large derivation in order to say something about the quality factor or the Q of the filter. If you have a very complicated filter, you only need to look at the frequency response of that filter to say something about Q. If you see a peak, a very sharp peak, in a filter's frequency response, you can just say, well, that filter obviously has a very high Q. If you see only a very gentle peak or a very wide passband in a filter's frequency response, then you could say, well, that filter obviously has a very low Q. And you can make those conclusions without having to derive the transfer function.